Have you ever wondered what happens when God's people become complacent? Welcome to Through the Bible. Today, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us the answer to that question as we continue our study in the Old Testament book of Haggai. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and I'm so glad that you're here today. And as you climb aboard the Bible bus, why don't you find your seat and open your Bible to Haggai chapter 1 and let me share a letter from a listener named Sandra in Illinois. I'll warn you ahead of time, it's a little longer than the letters that I usually read, but it is such a great story. I want you to hear the entire thing, so stay with me. Sandra writes, Over the past 10 years, I have been praying and waiting on the Lord to do a mighty work in the life of my husband. I didn't know for sure if he was a prodigal son or a prodigal pig, but today I can say with certainty that my husband is not a prodigal at all anymore. On March 17th, he began experiencing some medical issues that had him afraid of dying. As I rapidly drove him the 45 minutes to the emergency room, he expressed to me how sorry he was for the past 10 years of pain he had caused our family due to his sinful lifestyle. While driving, he asked me to sing hymns to him and pray for him. And then she continues, Over the next couple days, I began to see little changes, but I didn't want to jump to any conclusions because I've learned over the years that nagging doesn't do anything. It has to be someone yielding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit to bring about true change. Some of the first changes were in the foul TV shows that he began to turn off, and then I noticed how his speech changed. He wasn't using the coarse language anymore, and he expressed a desire to give up smoking. Then the next step was on April 6th when he shared with me that he had been listening to Dr. McGee for a week already and asked if I would be willing to listen to it with him each day. I usually listened to Through the Bible while driving. Okay, there's even better news, Sandra says. Listen, since April 6th, we have listened together each day through your wonderful app. I cannot express to you how much this has meant to me, my husband, and also to us as a couple. I have prayed for years to see spiritual fruit in his life, and I want to shout it from the mountaintops that what started as a little flower blossom a few weeks ago is continuing to grow each day. With the Bible teaching we are getting daily from through the Bible, I know that more fruit is on the way as we water our spiritual lives with God's Word. I thank the Lord Jesus Christ for answering prayers and a special thanks to your ministry as it reaches across the globe and into homes like ours. To God be the glory. Well, to God be the glory for sure. You know, if you want to hear what Dr. McGee's message on the prodigal pig is from 2 Peter 2, 21 and 22, and it is a good one, just visit our website at ttb.org where you can listen to all of our five-year messages for free. Or if you want to listen on TTB's app, it's available in any of the major app stores. And if you have a story that you'd like to share about how God is using the study of his word in your life, we'd certainly love to hear from you. Just email it to BibleBus at ttb.org or send your note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, thank you for the grace that you extend to each one of us through your Son, Jesus. Bless your word as it goes out today. And through it, please help more people as well as our family members, our friends, and those all around the world to realize their need for you and to turn to you and find you waiting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, as we come to this little book, as I said at the very beginning, you're going to find it different from any other book that we have studied of the prophets. Now, he puts a great emphasis, as we said, upon the word of the Lord. And I want to read verse 1 again and move on from there. In the second year of Darius the king. Now, again, may I say that we are now geared into a calendar that is the calendar of the times of the Gentiles. The Lord Jesus said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's still true right at this very moment. Now we are in those times here, definitely so. It's not geared to a king of Israel or Judah, not geared anymore to the Davidic line. But the calendar now refers to them. And it's the first day of the month, and the month is the sixth month. Now, I have to say this to you categorically because... When you take the Jewish calendar, you will find that this is September the 1st 
520. Now, here's a book you can date very easily. And he says unto Zerubbabel, he is the political ruler, the son of Shealtiel. And Zerubbabel, as we said, means sown in Babylon. Or he was raised in Babylon. He has a Babylonian name, by the way. He had been born in captivity. Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. You have both the religious and the civil ruler mentioned. Verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Let's look at that for just a moment. Here is what God says the people were saying, and this is what they were saying. You see, when they first return back to the land, they return with great enthusiasm. The anticipation was high. But they met gigantic obstacles, which required Herculean effort and hardships. And after they went through a period like that, they became discouraged when they began to build the temple. And so they rationalized that it was just not the time to build. In other words, this was their pseudo-consolation. They decided to maintain the status quo. Well, it's so hard, evidently God doesn't intend us to do it. The foundation of the temple was laid, but the opposition of the Samaritans was so intense that they simply stopped the building. They didn't go on with it. And their excuse is, well, the time has not come. Now, this is going to hurt just a little, friends, because Haggai is going to put the knife in where the trouble spot is, I think, today in the lives of many Christians. Have you ever heard someone explain the fact that they gave up doing something or that they didn't go someplace or that sort of thing? And they said, well, the Lord's will was for me to do otherwise. Or the Lord directed me to do this sort of thing. You know, that expression, that Christian cliche today covers a multitude of sins. It's so easy when things get hard and they get rough to turn in a report to everyone and say, well, The Lord's leading me otherwise. Many a preacher, I'm afraid, that when the going gets rough in a church, and it's rough for the pastor today, my heart goes out to pastors who are really trying to serve God. But it's so easy to say, well, the Lord is leading me elsewhere. And if any of us that get on a hot spot, that's the answer we come up with, well, the Lord is leading me elsewhere. Now, these people started building the temple, and the going was rough. You recall reading Nehemiah when they were rebuilding the walls. Look at the opposition that that man had when he tried to rebuild the walls. Well, they had the same kind of opposition in building the temple. And the people turned it off by saying, well, it's not the Lord's time to do this. Now, I... Remember when we attempted to remodel the church in downtown Los Angeles that I had served? In its long history, it had never been remodeled. And the seats in there, 4,000 of them, by the way, they were built to take care of people 50 and 60 years ago. And do you know that we discovered something that people are about two and a half inches wider today than they were 50 and 60 years ago? That ought to tell you something, at least the people that go to church. So we got new pews and put them in. And cushioned pews, by the way, lovely. And we had some very pious souls that said, well, we don't feel like money should be spent for cushioned seats. We should give that money to missions. Well, the majority of the folk wanted to cushion seats. So did I. And so I made a proposition to those folk. I said, now, look, what we're going to do is there are many people here that are so enthusiastic about remodeling that they're going to give enough for their seat and your seat, too. They're going to pay for both of the pews. And you don't have to give to 
buying a seat. You say the money should be given to missions. Now, come on, give $25 to mission. And I said, I'd hope that we can take up an offering today of several hundred $25 checks. You know that we got very few that day. You know why? Because the time hadn't come. It wasn't the Lord's will. And they never intended to give, and they used the excuse of not giving to the new seats because they said it should be given to missions. Well, if it should be given to missions, why didn't they give it? They didn't. And may I say to you that I had the privilege in every church I've served to remodel it. That seems to have been my lot. I've never built a new church, but I sure have remodeled every one I've been in. And I've always encountered that problem. There was always a little group. They're very small, thank God for that. And they don't do anything, but they're good at criticizing. And that was always the excuse. Oh, this money shouldn't be spent here on us. We should give it to missions. Well, why didn't they give it to missions? They didn't. Oh, this crowd here and Haggai just pulls the Band-Aid off and exposes the sore that's here. And you can be sure of one thing, this wasn't an ouchless band-aid that he pulled off. It hurt. You can be sure of this. Will you listen to what he has to say to them in answer to this? Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. This is the message now that he's going to give, his answer to them. And this is message number one, given on September the 1st, 520. Now, here is God's answer. Will you listen to it? Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai. You notice this man, back of the word of the Lord all the way through. To God be the glory. It wasn't just a song to him. He made it that way. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your paneled houses and this house to lie waste? The point was this. These people said it's not time to build the Lord's house, but they all built their own houses, and it seemed to have been time to do that. Isn't it amazing today? I found this true not only as a pastor, but I found it true in radio today. Great many people promise, yes, I think the Lord's leading me to help you. And then a little later on, the going got rough for them a little, and they said, well, maybe it's not the Lord's will for me to do this. You see, the minute that things become difficult, why, that's the moment we decide it's not the Lord's will. But when it is something that's for our own selfish ends, we generally do that, don't we? Or we make the effort that is required to accomplish that will always be to our benefit. For instance, these people were, all of them, living in panel houses. How in the world were they able to do that? And there were difficulties, but they overcame the difficulties to build their own house. But they were not able to overcome the difficulties to build the Lord's house. And their lame excuse was the time is not here. It's just not the Lord's will right now for us to do this. Oh, I get so weary of hearing people say that as an excuse for not doing something for God. It's not the Lord's will. What do you know about the Lord's will? Just because it's difficult, it's hard, it's going to cost you something, does that mean that it's not the Lord's will? May I say to you, that's not the way you interpret the Lord's will. Sometimes it's very rugged and very difficult. Oh, if we could have some of the choice saints of God of the past here today, they would tell us, I wonder what Abraham would have to say to these people today, said, well, it's not the Lord's will for me to do this. This man lived down in Ur, the Chaldees, had a nice business down there. You can be sure of one thing. This man who's the father of the Israelites was a good businessman, and he was doing well in Ur of the Chaldees. That was a highly civilized city in that day. 
prosperous city. Luxury was there. God says, I want you to get up and get out of this place. Very easy for Abraham to tell his neighbors. He said, I must have misunderstood. The Lord never asked me to leave this place here. It's soft. It's easy. And therefore, it just couldn't be the Lord's will for me to do this thing at all. Friends, may I say to you, there are literally thousands of missionaries down yonder on the mission fields of this world today. They're out there, and many of them making great sacrifices. Why? Because they thought it was the Lord's will for them to go. I wonder how many are at home today that ought to be out there. I wonder how many church members there are that busiest termites putting on banquets and doing things in the church that don't require really any hardship. It's not any standing up to it, not opposition, not really getting out the Word of God. I wonder how many are there today, and they're trying to say, well, this is God's will for me, but it's not God's will for me to make a sacrifice for God. My, how he bears down in Haggai, let you know that this is the word of God that he's given. This is what God said. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your panel houses and this house to lie waste? Now, I always feel very badly when I'm in a place like Mexico and I see those ornate cathedrals and people living in poverty around those cathedrals. It's easy for us to point our finger to that today and say, that just isn't right. And I'll agree that that just isn't right. But when I see a church that needs so much, it needs to be made attractive. It has to be attractive to get the sinner in, friends. And nothing is being done along that line at all. I know several churches I've been in, and that's been their weak excuse. I remember staying with a deacon, and he told me, he says, you know, we believe in giving to missions here. We believe in that, and that's the reason we don't have a carpet on the floor in the church, and that's the reason that we have not put in new pews. Do you know that he took me to his home, and I was treated royally by that man? Never had such wonderful hospitality extended. He put me in a guest room that's nicer than anything I've ever been in. And he had a home that, I'm told, cost over $100,000 back in the old days. Not today, but back in the old days. I have a notion to be twice that today. And, you know, it's all I could do to keep quiet. I had to bite my tongue to try to keep quiet and not say, well, you believe in giving to missions and you don't put a rug on a church auditorium at all. And it's not very attractive. And then look here at your home. What about that? Couldn't you have spared just a little here? You should have built maybe not quite as large. A $50,000 home in that day would have been one a luxury. Couldn't you have taken the other 50000 and given that to the missions that you seem to be so interested in? May I say to you, friends, how much are you really spending on yourself and how much are you really doing for God today? It gets down close to us, does it not? May I use another illustration? I went with a friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine. He's a fine Christian layman. He took me out to dinner, and it's rather expensive. He left a generous tip for the waitress. And then he wanted to take me to a service that night to hear a certain preacher. He thought I should hear him. And we went and heard a good sermon. And when the offering plate was passed, I watched him. He put in one dollar, but he must have given that waitress either two or three dollars. And I thought, my, he's not even tipping God in an honest way. He tips the waitress in the restaurant more than he tips God at a service. May I say to you, friends, this rather gets down where we live, does it not? These people were saying it's just not the time for the Lord's house to be built. God says, then how is it time that your house has been built? May I say to you, the hypocrisy 
that is in the church is something that is sickening to a great many folk. They hear people boast of what they do for God, but what they do for themselves is a thousand times more than what they're doing for God. I told you this was going to hurt. I told you that Haggai wouldn't be popular. This man never did win a popularity contest. He just never could do that sort of thing at all. It just wasn't in him. He's rather like an alarm clock. You know, the alarm clock will never become the most treasured possession of the average American. It's an institution of our contemporary society, but not one that will be put in museums. The uh, alarm clock will never win a loving cup or popularity contest. We never like to be waked up out of a sound and restful sleep. The culprit that does it's a criminal, and he should be punished, not rewarded. They're trying now, I understand, to make alarm clocks with different kinds of pleasant sounds, soft music, honeyed words. But my friend, a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. The alarm clock with any other sound is still an alarm clock. Even some large corporations funnel in periodically during working days soft and pleasing music. Better than the lash of the taskmaster or the whip of a Simon Legree to make employees produce. But you see, when people are comfortable and satisfied they do not want to hear a disturbing voice or displeasing sound. And today, our nation is prosperous and powerful and comfortable and confident and satisfied and satiated. Yes, we've come through that type of a period. And woe to anyone who disturbs us, sounds an alarm, blows a whistle, turns on the siren. In one community, a church was restrained from putting up chimes because it wake up people Sunday morning in the neighborhood. You know, if Paul Revere rode again today, he'd be arrested for disturbing the peace. John the Baptist would lose his head, not for rebuking a king's sinful life, but for being a rabble rouser and a calamity howler. That's the reason God's prophets never won a popularity contest. They were stoned, not starred, rejected. And Haggai may I say, it's an alarm clock. He disturbs us. He wakes us up. And frankly, friends, we just don't like that. He occupied a very difficult position. He was on a rough spot. He stood between a rock and a hard place. And people were numb, you see, to his message. They didn't want to hear it. They had just come out of Babylon. They didn't want to hear him say what he said to them but he's attempting to wake them up to do something for God. Now we're going to see next time how he did that. This man did it in a very unusual way, but not very original by any means. Yet it's a way that, frankly, is just not being used today. And I think it would be effective if we would adopt the method of Haggai in God's work. We'll see what it was next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. The book of Haggai certainly is sounding a loud alarm, isn't it? You know, if you've been jolted awake, it's time to look at your own life and maybe see how it matches the Word of God. If you want to get started, let me offer you a few suggestions on how we can help you. First, as I mentioned earlier, you can listen to today's study or any of Dr. McGee's messages from our five-year journey for free by visiting our website at ttb.org. Or if you'd like to purchase the entire five-year audio program, maybe to give to a family member or friend, it's available on our Bible Bus flash drive that also includes all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for our study, as well as more than 100 of his digital booklets. This terrific little tool is one of the many great Bible study resources that we offer you. So some of them are for purchase, but many of them are for free. And when you visit us at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, we'd be glad to help you out. Again, that's 1-800-652-4253. And when you call us, be sure to tell us how you listen to Through the Bible. So thanks in advance for helping us be good stewards of the resources that God provides through faithful listeners around the world. And speaking of our supporters, I want to give a special shout out, a thank you to those who keep the Bible bus rolling each day. In more than 120 languages, millions of people are feasting on God's Word and growing closer to Him 
because of your sacrificial and generous support. We're so grateful for your partnership as together we take God's whole word to his whole world. Now as we go, I hope that you'll join us tomorrow as we continue this wonderful adventure through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?